Can't get enough of Kelly and Rumya? We're now on YouTube for you to indulge in highlights from our show. Today, we're kind of going to continue the conversation about AI and image description, uh, but kind of taking it to a new level, right? Mm. Yeah, so I'm still totally preoccupied with with um, <laughs> be my AI, but um, thanks to the input of uh, someone whose initials are <coughs> Ramya Amuthan, uh, I took <laughs> oh, it to the I next level in the following way, which is chat gpt does obviously as we know if we watch the news way more than image description including mm -hmm. making things up and writing which mm. is controversial for many reasons mm. as it should be controversial but it's it's a fact and it's a going thing and so what i did was I took three photos very deliberately um, mm -hmm. and I had the AI described them for me and then I gave it some prompts and I've got two sets of results. And so I'm going to describe the photos just really quickly myself, just so we can get to the juicy stuff. The <laughs> photos I took very deliberately were one is of a silver bracelet on a wooden wooden surface. And mm -hmm. the second is a wall showing three guitars and one empty guitar hook. And the third photo is the maple tree in my backyard turning color. Write a folktale in prose, short, in a somber tone, about grief. Avoid use of the word quaint. Be my AI. In a dimly lit room adorned with guitars, there lived an old musician named Harold. The guitars once full of life, now hung silently on the wall, mirroring the emptiness in Harold's heart. His life had been filled with melodies, but the music died the day he lost his beloved wife, Elora. One gloomy day, as Harold was aimlessly wandering around the room, his foot stumbled upon something. It was a small, silver-braided bracelet that belonged to Elora. The sight of the bracelet brought a flood of memories and tears to his weary eyes. Driven by a sudden urge, Harold decided to take a walk outside, clutching the bracelet. The world outside seemed as desolate as his heart. He walked until he found himself in front of an ancient, towering tree. The tree was almost bare, with only a few red leaves clinging to its branches, as if holding on to the last vestiges of life. Harold felt an inexplicable connection to this tree. He sat down at its base and began to weep. His tears soaked into the roots and something magical happened. The tree seemed to absorb his grief. The wind rustled through the branches, and Harold could hear faint whispers. It was as if the tree was speaking to him, sharing stories of all the souls it had comforted over the centuries. Harold, still clutching Elora's bracelet, felt a gentle nudge to tie it to one of the branches. As he did, the red leaves on the tree glowed with a soft light. The whispers grew louder and he could distinctly hear Elora's voice among them. She spoke words of love and told him that she was now at peace. The tree, with its ancient wisdom, had become a guardian for the memories and love of those who had passed. It stood as a testament that even in grief, there is a connection that transcends the physical world. So again, so it's, it's formulaic. Yeah. It's like got a lot of cliches, but one thing I did notice is that it had a tiny bit of use of metaphorical language mm, when it mm -hmm. said he felt a nudge to attach the bracelet to a tree. That's a metaphorical use of language. He didn't have someone pushing his arm. Right. He felt a, a, a nudge. So it's a it's a use of metaphor. And so I really think, as I've you know I've said in other contexts on this subject, that we're seeing the infancy of a a a. a something that's dying to be a storyteller mm, it mm. really wants to tell us stories as as we know grant i think you you've been using this a lot for description so you know it really I, wants to use words like quaint and picturesque and <laughs> yeah I'm and so you, to... you... Mm -hmm. go ahead well you you can tell it not to do that but it's it's dying to make friends with you and yes, tell you yes, a story yes, and so give you some ever. cliches and comforting language yeah what were you gonna I'm, say i'm grant? just trying to get over the his tears soaked into the roots. Yeah, or yeah. Whatever it said. Like that's very <laughs> dramatic. It's it's it, yeah. It was huge. Like it was a cute story and and kind of emotional too. It's just it's weird to me that like the 
a computer is coming up with this without knowing what it means, but I can I can see <laughs> the infancy of that creative writing right. with AI. And also, and we've seen it in other contexts where AI is playing roles, right? Like AI will be a professor, AI will be a psychologist, AI will be your family member. Um, and I think that a lot of what I'm hearing, like the underlying is, how do we make AI more us? Like if you're mm. wanting to write and you're like, this is a little flat for me, I want more metaphors, I wouldn't have used this there. Is it also just learning our writing style? I don't know if we can do that mm. with this generic um, method or tool, which is, was it BM, Be My AI that you were using? So ChatGPT? Yes. Yeah, so yeah. I don't know if this can cater to us particularly, but in a sense, isn't that what we're doing? Like we're uploading ourselves and our writing styles with the prompts and with our preferences, and then hopefully it's becoming better at understanding what we want in a story, where we would go with it. And if you are a writer already with yeah. a body of work, you can submit your yeah. whole novel probably totally. to Chad yeah. GPT and say, write me a novel, a science fiction novel about this, this, this plot points in this style. Yes. And I don't know how it yeah, would do, you... but obviously like a folktale, it is a very formulaic thing. So mm -hmm. in a way, it's not the best, um, it's not the most challenging to give to, to an AI. But uh, yeah. I decided to start with it because I knew the kinds of tropes it would come up with mm -hmm. and, and yeah. it did and they're pretty boring <laughs> so yeah, you... in my yeah, go ahead great no go ahead in my personalizing of the story that i'm working on i threw in a lot of whimsical language and a lot of right. informality mm -hmm. and and stuff yeah. to make it more personal because you can kind of give it this prompt this like system prompt of of what you want in right. fact uh, be my ai actually has one too it says that if you're describing an image to a blind person uh really interesting discussion we got to go there thanks so much christine thank you we're going to continue on with artificial intelligence, but in a different context. Uh, and our guest now joining us is Dr. Yuda Treviranus. She's the director of OCAD University's Inclusive De Design Research Center. And she's with us today to chat about an exciting announcement. She's recently been appointed as chair of the Standards Committee to develop a standard on accessible and equitable artificial intelligence systems for Accessibility Standards Canada and the Accessible Canada Act. That is a lot to take on. We want to know exactly what this mean means. Dr. Trevor Rennes, thank you for coming on, Kelly and Rumia. Thank you. And um, it, it was fascinating to listen to the end of the last uh, segment that you had, they, it spoke to the extreme opportunities that exist potentially within mm. AI. We can make it accessible and equitable. And um, so th that is part of what I'm attempting to do. Oh, fantastic. And I'm curious about the context around this. Uh, obviously, AI is one of the most rapidly changing technologies in our lifetimes. What are some of those accessibility and equi equity uh, issues for large language models that you want to bring up in this little time that we have to spend with you? Well, actually, I'm working on a phased approach where mm. we initially address uh, all of those pervasively deployed uh, uses of AI that currently happen. There are AI is used to make hundreds of decisions that affect our life and that have a, a huge influence on us. And if you have a disability, then um, there are a number of ways in which AI and those AI decisions can be quite harmful because AI is choosing for the majority. It's optimizing the successes mm. for um, people who were successful in the past, and it's not recognizing you if you are in any way anomalous or not like the average of the data set that has been trained on. So um, while we're also moving towards the, the generative AI or the large language models and things like chat GPT, the first thing we want to do is to address the um, pervasive deployment of AI in everything from who gets hired, 
who um, gets admitted into a college or a university, who gets mortgages, what your red credit rating is, what type of advertisements are shown, um, what uh, the politicians will put on their platform, uh, who gets audited for tax uh, purposes, etc. So <laughs> that's the first stage. Mm -hmm. And then once we've addressed those fairly significant harms that people are not really as yet uh, fully aware of, um, chat GPT and generative AI and large language models have caught the attention of everyone. But there are many other uh, instances or uses of AI that um, are to us, uh, people are not conscious of. They There may be decisions made about you that you don't even know that an AI was helping to make those decisions. And if an AI is making a decision, it's uh, frequently not making exceptions for people that are not like the, the average of that data set or not like the majority. Can you maybe give an example of some of the tangible harms out there or incorrect decisions that AI could be making or that you've seen it make related to the right. disability community? And how are you addressing those critical issues? Right. So um, one of the things that I've been doing over the past year or two is to look at harm and incident databases. We started to sound the alarm um, well uh, before. Um, so back in 2013, 13, et cetera, about this, a specific type of harm, which we call statistical discrimination. Mm -hmm. The AI is using statistics to um, make decisions. Even the, the generative AI and large language models is just using statistics. It's saying, if uh, this is the, the word, then the most likely next word is going to be this word. Mm -hmm. And um, it, uh, there's modifiers to that. So if this is in the area of humor or whatever, then the most likely next word is this word. And and so th that statistical discrimination discriminates towards the majority and away from the minority or away from people who are not um, the majority within the data set it was trained in. So what are the some of the harms? Um, there are the typical harms that you've probably heard of in the news, such as if you are unlike people who were employed within an organization before or within the organization that the system is trained on, then you will likely not be picked to get an interview. Um, and uh, the interpretation within, say, an assessment that is done for employment will likely rule you out. Um, but there are, in watching the databases there, it's spreading much further. And unfortunately, it's been an exercise and a bit of I told you so, that these things would be emerging. Mm. So parents with disabilities have been falsely flagged as unfit. Um, there are many more false positive tax audits if you have an unusual tax filing, which most people with disabilities will have, um, false positive security flagging. So security flagging, whether it's at airport or, or in other situations, because you're not like um, what the system is expecting, it will flag you for additional uh, security uh, screening. Um, you can um, biased credit and acid ratings, uh, being denied mortgages and loans, um, unfair un, uh, high insurance rates. Um, uh, the But there's also these things that many of the systems that are intended to protect everybody uh, against AI bias, such as um, the risk assessments or the impact assessments that many governments are implementing, are also using statistical reasoning. So uh, if the incidents that occur to you because you are anomalous and because you have a disability um, a turn up, they will be deemed to be anecdotal and um, too low an incident or too low a risk when balanced against the benefit to the majority. So I, I'm worried about both the initial implementation of AI, but also the protections that are being put in that are ignoring the risks to people with disabilities. Mm. Yeah, and it's the kind of worry about 
is it too late to pull back and where are we headed because obviously the growth is exponential in just any kind of use case for ai so it worries me like these are the things to worry about the ethics around it um how do how do we plan on addressing these ethics you know is it teaching ai a different way, uh, a different way of calculating, a different way of analyzing, a different way of averaging out, like all these different examples that you gave? Or is it still a lot of human intervention on a case-by-case basis? Because I I don't know if that's even possible anymore. Right, yeah. (laughs) That's a really good question. And if we ask to be excluded from the AI-based decision, are we going to get service that is equivalent, just as timely, um, just as smooth, you know, Uh, offered at the same time. Um, So that is a a huge question. But I think one of the hopeful things is that um, in the uh, previous interview, you were talking about personalizing. Mm. And the the unfortunate thing with AI at, at the moment and statistical reasoning as it's used is that it is um doing what is average it is doing it is following the tropes it's following the patterns and when it comes to discrimination it's automating amplifying and accelerating the discrimination that's all already there so the harm was there before ai amplified it we've always had statistical reasoning in most of our decision systems whether it's voting whether it's majority rules um determination of of uh, what will be happening or whether it's figuring out what is in fact uh, good evidence uh, empirical evidence it's usually based upon statistics can we statistically show that um this particular thing is true for the majority and so i i think it it takes not just looking at AI, but it's also looking at how do we decide and how have we been deciding? And is that um, what happens to people who are not the majority, who are outliers? And so um, one of the questions that was asked in the previous discussion was, can we personalize it? And Mm. personalization means that the AI has to recognize that people are different and people have different priorities and different ways in which they want to optimize their life. Um, the the really wonderful things that AI is currently doing, such as pattern recognition or Be My Eyes, um, that sort of thing is also actually subject to this statistical discrimination. Because if you were to take that system and use it in a place where um, there are th- all the products have a different language on them, mm-hmm. or it's a very poor environment that has, or it's it's an environment that has completely different products, different different street layouts, different ways of mark demarcating a bathroom. Um, then it will not work because it's based upon uh, what the average of what it is trained on, and. Uh, So, uh, for example, we tried it out in a village in Kenya and it recognized almost nothing. Um, So it's the the what that does in terms of some of these systems is it means that the people that need it the most are the people that for whom it works the worst. And so even with the miraculous, wonderful things that AI can do, um, it is still it works best for the majority. It, it works best in um, situations that are average and that are fami- that are largely familiar um, with respect to the training set. Uh, so the there is hope here because AI in and of itself, in order to be able to um, actually work for the diversity of experiences that we want from it, will have to do something other than use the um, the bias towards the t- statistical mean or the statistical average. And we've well, been I... experimenting with things like uh, data exploration. So rather than finding me the the um, most uh, the uh, person that is most likely to have have a success in the workplace, according to the data from past successes, explore with me and tell me, Um, find me some people that are somewhat that are different um, that bring other perspectives into the situation etc sorry I think I heard you start a new question no 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 (laughs) and uh, man we need 
we need to do a part two uh, because we're we're almost out of time. But I guess that's what I'm really curious about. So, so you think there's hope, like it's not, it's an opportunity as much as a, a crisis. Yes, but it's going to take um, <laughs> quite a. Um, it it's going to take a lot to change um, the AI to change the direction that the yeah. AI is going yeah. and potentially to change our habits as well. And that's why um, I've, I've been working on this um, e equitable and accessible AI standard, which will will be uh, going to committee. And hopefully um, we, we hope to, to bring it out in a timely fashion. And we are turning it into an international effort with international committee members so that it can be harmonized across various countries because of course ai knows no uh, national boundaries exactly um, and we're yeah, also exactly <laughs> yeah and we're going to have a um a conference actually in montreal at concordia university on may 27th and 28th where we're hoping to bring a large part of the the disability community together to see uh, what are the things that we can do that would both um uh improve the benefits that we get from AI, but also uh, re reduce harms. And I really hope we can get you on before that conference, because it sounds like such an important opportunity for people to take part. Thank you so much for coming on. This has been such a unique discussion on uh, everything as it stands with AI right now. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you yeah. for having me. All right, we'll talk to you soon. Thanks for watching. You can catch Kelly and Rumya weekdays from 2 to 4 p.m. Eastern on AMI.